Hi, this is Meg Riley in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and you've joined us for another week of The View. Aisha, how are you? This is Aisha Hauser, and I'm in Seattle, and I'm doing well. And uh, once we get started, I'm looking forward to talking about briefly about our first topic. I have a lot of feelings. Christina, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm Christina Rivera, and I'm coming to you from Charlottesville, Virginia, and I'm looking forward to all the topics today. I might have to pop up um, a little bit early. Um, we're doing some court support for um, Corey Long, who is one of the uh, protesters, um, resistant protesters here in Charlottesville on, we call it A12, August 12th of last year, that's being prosecuted for um, actually resisting white supremacy. So a um, bunch of us are, are uh, getting together and doing some court support tomorrow, and today we're doing a little bit of planning. So if I pop off early, that's why. Michael. Hi, everyone. This is Michael Tino joining you from Peekskill, New York. Um, I'm glad that you're able to do that support, Christina. Um, things, things are good here. I, I'm working on no days off this week. I was in Albany on Monday with the New York State chapter of the Poor People's Campaign. And for those of you who live in state capitals or right next to state capitals, consider yourself very lucky. Um, many, many of us uh, have to trek quite a ways to get to ours. So uh, it was good, and I have more questions than I had before I, before I went, but that's another show. And Jessica Star Rockers, you are here uh, running tech. I'm here running tech in the early hours on the West Coast near Seattle. Uh, Asia, shout out. So um, <laughs> um, I'm on um, fielding your questions here on Facebook Live. I'm on Twitter on hashtag The View where you can find me there. And um, yeah, happy to be here. And we're excited today to have uh, a couple of members and hopefully a third will be joined. Well, three, sorry, Michael's, Michael's double duty today. He's got two hats on. Uh, and we'll be joined by another from the Presidential Search Committee, the folks who have been meeting, I think, since 1953, as near as I can tell, to, uh, to work on the, the whole search process. And for the first time, we had nominations. And so um, guesting with us today, we have the Reverend Dr. Matthew Johnson, who's the senior minister of the UU Church of Rockford, Illinois, who co-chaired the Presidential Search Committee. With whom did you co-chair it? My ignorant self asks, Matthew. Uh, with uh, Liz Jones, who's the retired okay. director of religious education at our church in San Diego. Great. And we also have Wayne Arneson, uh, another member of the Presidential Search Committee, who is now retired, just completing an interim ministry in Sterling, Virginia, and has provided ministry in many places and many forms uh, for many years. So, Wayne, welcome. And um, Matthew, why don't you tell us... and. And Michael, of course, also was on the Presidential Search Committee. Matthew, why don't you tell us the rest of the people who are not here? Sure. Uh, Alondria Williams uh, from uh, Tennessee and, of course, now co-moderator of the board, Unitarian Universalism, Unitarian Universalist Association. And um, Joanna Fontaine Crawford, who's very familiar to all of you uh, from her time at CLF and serving one of our churches in Texas. And... Um, I got to go through the, I got to go Jackie around. Jackie Williams, who will be joining Jackie us Williams later, we think. Us hopefully soon, who's a lay leader in Albany, uh, New York. Um, I think that's everybody, right? Yeah. yeah. That's Seven great. of us. Five okay. were elected by the delegates and two appointed by the board. That's great. Thanks for your work. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But first, we just wanted to visit briefly. We could do a whole show on it, but we're not. Uh, the... The uh, resolution that's coming to the General Assembly to accord a right to vote to religious educators. This has been long in the work by Lareda and a number of congregations. And I should say my first GAs, I was a religious educator with no vote. And it felt very weird to go there, to not be able to be a member of the church that I served and to also not be able to be a delegate and yet to have such passion for what I consider the center of the faith, which is the families, the children and the youth especially. So I am, as you might guess, um, quite solidly in support of this. I've been a little surprised to see how many of my ministerial colleagues are now saying they've never thought ministers should have the vote. Because I will say, 
this is something I've never heard a minister say before now. And it's just making me wonder if they have this strong conviction, why it's only coming out now, because I have to say, I've never heard them say, I'm not going to vote because I don't think I should have a vote. So I'm just, I'm, I'm watching the conversation that's taking place around a lot of different things that are, you know, important to talk about polity and, you know, all kinds of stuff. But I, I frame it really as a mission, a matter of mission, and that if our mission is to be a religion and we don't care about kids, I don't think we're worthy of the name. That is just my bottom line. So anybody else have an opinion about this? Well, I, I don't know that I really do, but no, I, 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 I had the same feeling you did, Meg, that um, I, I've never heard of any minister bringing a resolution to GA wanting to take away um, the automatic delegate status for ministers who serve congregations. And I, I, like you said, I mean, there's certainly valid conversations to have of an, the validity of GA or the elitism, or there's several conversations. However, what right, the question right now on the table that Lareda members worked hard to do over the past few years is to bring this resolution to the General Assembly floor, this General Assembly in Kansas City. You can vote against it. I mean, certainly that's your right. And to, to vote, the argument to vote against it because ministers shouldn't have it is to me a simple, we have someone used the metaphor of, you know, I could see how this sounds like we don't, we'd rather break our toy than share it. And so that's what it absolutely feels like because I, like you, Meg, I'd never heard, ever, never heard ministers suddenly become very passionate that none of us should have the right to vote. Uh, so it's, it's, it's disappointing um, because if you don't think religious educators should have the vote, then say that. But the idea that all of a sudden nobody should vote is uh, it really is disappointing. You know, regular viewers of The View uh, are, are by now hopefully familiar with the, with the um, gigantic pile of nonsense that white people uh, come up with every time we start talking about white supremacy. Um, so I just want to name this as a gigantic pile of minister nonsense that's being brought up because we're talking about structural inequalities that are baked into our, our professional systems. Um, so I have an opinion too. <laughs> um, you can see on my Facebook profile that I'm, that I'm in support of this, but our con the congregation that I serve is proud to have been one of the, one of the congregations that helped put this on the GA agenda. Um, and uh, you know, we have folks registering as offsite delegates because we're not, we don't have too many people going to GA just so that they can be at the plenary to vote in favor of this. Um, yeah, I just want to name, maybe ministers shouldn't vote as a gigantic pile of minister nonsense. So I, I think I can do that, right? <laughs> And I think that that's, you know, part of, as we go through this, as we, you know, the, the religious educators um, will not be the first and, and certainly the last um, religious professional group to talk about having a voice at the table. And that was a large part of um, when the UA Board of Trustees, and I'm on the Board of Trustees, uh, met and talked about the the different uh, resolutions, by resolutions that were coming through, um, and was you know we we talked about even it being broader and and being all of the religious professional um, organizations that had reciprocal um, uh, collegial covenant uh, wording in our religious professional organizations, and and I think you know I I I've absolutely understand congregational polity and I understand it in a way I think that that is different in terms of what that means in terms of our responsibility to each other um, and so I don't think that having religious professionals um, with a delegate voice um, changes that polity I think it enhances it and draws us closer into um, beloved community in which we are all um, talking with each other and, and you know rather than narrowing that that group of folks that have a voice um, broadening it and is really what we're trying to do so um, 
you know, I think that if folks feel so passionately that no religious professional should have uh, a delegate, automatic delegate status, awesome. Vote yes this <laughs> this GA, and next GA, go ahead and bring your own bylaw resolution. But to, um, I think it is a little bit disingenuous to say, oh, I shouldn't have this, and so you shouldn't have it either. Um, and and it's also a little, you know, paternalistic. Like, I know what's best for everyone. Um, and that's really the, you know, kind of what you're saying, Michael, the, the white uh, supremacy in our culture of saying, you know, the, the, the ministers know best. And so they get to decide, um, even, you know, for themselves and, and for everyone else. Um, as to who should and shouldn't. And uh, so I, I think there's, there's that, that would be a great conversation at the next gathering of UUMA, uh, <laughs> you know, to really dive into that and, and see, see what that's all about. But in terms of, you know, at this GA and this bylaw resolution, um, there, there's really no, no, in my opinion, substantive reason uh, not to support it. Wayne and Matthew, you, did, you didn't come to talk about this, but all opinions are always welcome. <laughs> so if you'd like to jump in, okay, you can take a pass and we'll move on to why we invited you, which is you had some pretty provocative recommendations of your own in the report that you issued about the whole process that you went through and, and what it is to select the president. So Matthew, why don't you start? I mean, I don't even know where to start. There are the executive summary alone has some bombshells in it, actually. So why don't you say what was most compelling to you about your conclusions? Sure. Um, and I appreciate people who are actually reading it. I think, you know, we a committee issues a report and people think it'll be sort of, you know, whatever. Um, and I hope people will read it because you're right. There are some really substantial and radical suggestions about how the campaign for president of the association happens um, and how that campaign is related to the work of the board and to the association as a whole. So I hope people will read it closely and think about it um, and then ask board members and others about and delegates, you know, what we're going to do about this. So I, I, the big picture is that we were charged explicitly with a very narrow task, nominate at least two people for the UUA president uh, by a certain date. Implicitly, we were charged with an enormous task to rethink, to, to bring into covenant rather than into politics, um, how we do this work and to do some discernment and to reach out past what has normally been the pathway toward this office. And we hit up pretty quickly in some places, the limitations of trying to do the implicit charge. And what we felt was, you know, important work um, with the structures. So a lot of the report indicates ways in which that implicit charge could actually be honored. Because you can't change one part of a 10 part process and think it's gonna change the other nine, right? So um, there are some substantial and important recommendations. Um, the overarching one is that the board, along with you know staff and um, leaders and congregations, um, really engage in a serious conversation about how this whole thing works. The um, Election Practices Commission also issued a final report that had similar recommendations about getting more clarity about whose role is whose, where does that authority begin and end. Um, so that's important. We recommended a much shorter campaign on a different schedule. So a six month or so campaign that would happen a year before, um, basically a year before the person takes office. The notion that a person would be elected on the Saturday at General Assembly and take office on the following Monday is crazy. Um, I mean, it's just, it's, a, it's impossible to do. And when we would go to people and say, so think about doing this, they would say, so I wouldn't know until the last week in June, whether or not I need to move my family to Boston in four weeks. Um, you can imagine given our more clear lens about white supremacy and classism, um, and gender as well, how that particular barrier is pr 
particularly exclusive. Um, there's a way in which our culture presumes that a person who might be president of the UA already lives in Boston. So to really push that out, so a shorter campaign, easier to do, more accessible, and we don't need it 18 months. Um, go to a general assembly and have the congregations vote in the congregation, not tourists to the general assembly, but the congregations vote together. They watch the videos, people who've met them at general assembly describe their encounters and they vote on who they want. Um, so that we actually do honor our sort of more sense of our polity than we're doing. We also thought about the question of compensating um, either a person directly or the employer um, so that a person could take the time off to do that shorter campaign. Um, it's still a real challenge for someone to run for the office, even if, with a shorter campaign without an associate minister, if they're parish minister or, you know, the UUA staff complications of doing that um, while still trying to do your UUA job, obviously, as you all know, uh, began Let's to- hold, uh, I'm gonna- yeah. I'm going to pause there because you've yes. said so much. Yes. Um, and and right. I, you can. I mean, <laughs> you can keep going a lot because, I mean, one of the things that I'll flag is that you brought up issues with both UUA staff and the UUA board and, and you know, officials. So I was thinking, Wayne, you've been on the staff, the board. Well, and so has Michael. You've both been on the staff, the board, and now the presidential search committee. So those particular issues, I'm curious you must see some of those complications remembering, you know, from, from different times, but both of those. So I'm curious ab about that issue as we move into it. Um, and maybe let's pause because Matthew, each one of those things you said are so significant. Um, so let's just start with having the congregations vote, not at general assembly. That in and of itself is a revolution, I think. Um, it really shifts where we think decisions should be made. Um, so I'm curious, you must have talked a lot about that as you decided it. Um, I, what, what came up as pros and cons and, and how did you, um, how'd you move to that? Any of you? I think we've all struggled with uh, how, uh, for any important piece of UUA business, uh, the issue comes alive in congregations and involves more people at the congregational level to be engaged and to think about the issue. And uh, we, I was actually on the commission that tried to reinvent the uh, Commission on um, Social Witness Process and tried to create something that would require congregational engagement for an issue to advance. And, you know, that's had mixed results in terms of how congregations respond to it. But just as with um, our national elections in the United States, there is a significant amount of attention that everybody pays to presidential elections in the UUA. And um, the structure of the General Assembly that we have uh, that continues to, uh, even though we, we try to talk about how to make it more accessible and how to remove uh, economic inequalities that prevent more people from coming and being involved, uh, this delegate-based system that we have does uh, limit um, the initiative that congregations want to take in advance to talk to their delegates who are coming. And it did seem to us that having the election after a general assembly at which congregational delegates did attend, in which there was a chance for face-to-face -face encounter with the candidates to listen to their speeches, people come home from that. And then there's some momentum going into the fall to have a, a real election in, a, in each congregation. Um, and each congregation can decide how to do that. And they can just do it by letting their delegates vote, but there's other ways that they could do it. And we could go ahead and encourage different models for how a congregation could engage with the election. And it just seemed to us that this would create a lot more involvement on, on the part of Unitarian Universalist members in the decision about how congregations votes were cast. So it'd still be that congregations had the delegates votes, but they'd do it by percentages or however they wanted to to empower those people. Michael, sorry. Yeah, you know, we spent a lot of time in in our committee talking about power and um, who has it 
and who has access to it. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about um, who felt empowered to put their names forward to be president even. Um, and, and then, you know, part of that discussion of power is the power of who gets to vote. And who gets to vote at General Assembly as, as we've, you know, already started discussing in our first uh, mini segment uh, is, is fraught with, um, with layers of power, right? Um, you know, as, as we've, we've seen, you know, religious educators at General Assembly are disenfranchised because of systemic issues regarding like where people can be members and what who gets to be a delegate from a congregation. Even if a congregation wants to give their religious educator a delegate credential, usually they're not a member of that congregation, right? But in, in a congregational setting, a religious educator who's been to GA, who's been to a Lareda annual meeting and, and talked with, the, with presidential candidates might actually have some influence on, on how, um, how votes are cast. Right, so because it's real, it's more relational influence, um, and that, that I think that's appropriate, right? So, so who has that influence is is a matter of uh, layers of power. It's 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 fascinating. We we just, you know, you can you can imagine those of you who know the people on this committee. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about issues of power. I also I also want to make sure that people watching the view. Um, know that everything that this committee said was was a consensus right so everything in the in the report including all of the recommendations um went through a formal consensus process i mean we didn't like have to get you know blocks and stand aside and we didn't really have to get there much because we we found after working together for four years that we agreed on a lot <laughs> but uh you know i've had people say after reading this oh well so and so must have really pushed for that, or so and so must have really opposed that. And I'm like, no, yeah, everything that was in there, all seven of us agreed on, um, which I think is important just to say. It also seems important to say that while the three of you are white men, that was not the makeup of the whole committee. And people watching this should not get the wrong idea. That's yeah, unfortunately, the three white men on the committee are the, the folks who could who could join you today because literally everyone else on the committee is not so and you know we that was an interesting dynamic one of the things in the report about our process was you know we in, noted that some of us had access to uh, i think what we called the former centers of power um and uh and those you know, so it was interesting kind of dynamic uh, among us. I will say, as I've said to the committee and I've said many times, this is the finest group of people I've ever worked with. Um, and it was really a, a pleasure to do the work. Um, and I think our report reflects that level of sort of uh, trust and confidence we had in each other and, um, and our process too. Um, and, you know, though there were some bumps in the road, uh, I think all of us were really thrilled with um, the people we were able to put forward. And though I joked about you starting in 1953, you actually really were working for what, four years? I mean, it was a long process to get close to these people. Five years, yeah. We were elected in 2013 and had met then for the first time. Um, and we wanted to get a jump start because it was the first time we'd done this process. So we did a lot of norm setting and uh, team building in the beginning, which really paid off down the road. If I could just uh, yeah. affirm what Matthew said about how I felt about working with this group of people and the uh, degree of trust that we were able to build over time with each other was um, very striking to me and, and very satisfying. The issue of trust going forward in the broad list of recommendations that we had is a, a crucial and interesting one for how the election process and this search committee model can be reformed for the next generation of the search committee. Because I think one of the things that you realize when you read through the recommendations is that uh, they do 
ask the board and the larger association um, if out of this process, they feel trusting enough going forward to give this presidential search committee yet more power. Um, trusting that we can bring together a group of people who can work together, who can be representative, and that with the recommendations that we made about how uh, advanced interviewing might happen to encourage discernment on the part of people who might otherwise uh, not feel that they have access to um, being in a campaign, uh, how the board could have interaction with people in discernment in advance so that there is a, a somewhat different interview process in advance than we did, and limiting other options for um, being on the ballot uh, to allow for this process to be um, a very important conversational and only game in town to uh, end up in candidacy. Now, that's a, that's a challenging set of recommendations, uh, and it does require I think th that we talk about this issue of whether any group of seven people can receive um, this kind of trust from the larger association. Because one of the recommendations is no nomination, no from the floor, no, no one comes through another um, channel. And tell me about the discussion that led to that. I, I, I was, a, that probably was one of the most surprising things that I read. Sure. So we, um, it's paired, let me be clear, that there needs to be an explicit um, process by which uh, candidates can be added to the ballot by the committee, previously vetted candidates, um, because of the, anyway, of the, how that kind of went down and what happens if somebody drops out and how do our process work. But if we're really going to do this, then we should really do it. And having the back door way that somebody can can get in um, means that people say, well, the process is what it is. And if we don't like, you know, who they nominate, then we'll run somebody else. But to say, no, this is the way, um, and the discernment is the way, it's also connected to asking the board to be really clear about what is the work of the association for the next six years going forward each time around. Um, you know, we brought to the board, here's a job description for the president. And they said, well, we've never had one of those. Um, so for the board to say, here's where we think we're going, the committee to say, here are the people we think can, can fulfill that vision in slightly different ways. And the congregations make the choice among them is a process that keeps people in the same conversation. And to have some parallel process left over from a untrusting kind of way of thinking about leadership, um, you know, you would, yeah, it, it doesn't really work. So we would eliminate it and failing that, um, the will to do that, we would raise the bar because the ability to run by petition is a very low um, threshold. Um, so to make that um, stronger if we're not willing to eliminate that capacity altogether. So my question on that is, is twofold. Um, I think actually that as some folks that have been involved in the nomination by, I haven't been involved in the nomination by, uh, by congregation process, but have witnessed it, it, it actually takes a fair amount of work um, to get that done. I think that it's, um, you know, if you're well known, it may be perceived as being easy. Um, but, you know, as I've witnessed Loretta move through the nomination of the bylaw revision process um, by congregation, it, it really does take a fair amount of work uh, to make that happen. And so, you know, whether or not that's the right bar, I think there's some discussion. But even stepping back from that, I'm curious as to the conversation around that parallel path, because I think there's a there's different reasons that that parallel path is there. I think trust is absolutely one of the one of the, as you all have named, one of the reasons it's there. Um, but that parallel path is also there for uh, marginalized folks, and. I think that when you have um, people who have been marginalized by, by a system, 
to ask that level of depth and trust of a system that hasn't um, necessarily done a good job at representing their, their uh, interests, um, that's when it's, it's a little bit difficult. And I think that's when um, you hear folks really like, whoa, what are you saying that, that we can't possibly have another way? Um, because let's, let's be honest, you know, the, even with that parallel system, we still had three white women, uh, running, um, you know, for this, for this position. And, um, and so I think folks would see that and then say, oh, and you're taking away the only other avenue of being able to change that. Um, I think that's going to take something that's going to take a lot of work. Like I think out of everything that that was in the recommendations, that that's the one where I'm like, ooh, because um, believe me, I, I I don't know anybody who would want to make this process longer <laughs> at this point, right? I, I would love to have Michael and Wayne chime in on this question, Christina, and I thank you for asking it. I think it needs a lot of thought and a lot of um, intention about it. Um, our experience was that the changes to the process allowed us to make a marginal but not complete movement toward being more inclusive to folks with marginalized identities who are not historically thought of in this role. But there was a limit to that. And some of the processes, you know, I, I hope might shift that. And that's also a culture shift that isn't about the next search committee at all, but it's about the association. I think there was a sense of, well, if the people the search committee puts forward aren't strong enough, then we've got a way to get ourselves the senior white male minister of large congregation to run through the petition. That was the kind of the Damocles of sword that was sort of hanging over. And I personally, I can't speak for the rest of me, I lived in fear of people saying, mm, no, you know, I don't like those folks. I'm going to run by petition and sort of Bigfoot the whole thing. And then we got another guy, you know, who fits the mold of every other guy we've had before not just male, but also a certain kind of way of being in the world. So I hope that the process is actually the inclusive, the search committee process is the inclusive way. And the other way has not historically been the case, but I do think it needs a lot of thought because you'd hate to close a door that could be used if the other door isn't open enough. If that makes sense. But I'd love to hear what Michael and Wayne say about that. You know what? Oh. Isha, it seems like you wanted to chime in first, if you don't mind. Yeah, please. Um, I actually, on this, I, I think I slightly disagree with Christina because I, what I have found in the UU system, I'm the incoming chair of the UUA nominating committee um, that populates some of the board and other committees. And I actually agree more with Matthew that what we do need, what I was very heartened by was the makeup of this nominating committee, that you had a religious educator and a minister co-chair, that you had a Landria, Jack, I mean, I was, I mean, the group, when I saw all of you, I was like, okay, I, I trust, and, and I mean, because we're such a small world, I knew most of you personally. Um, and I, and if, from what I've seen, I actually think, I agree with Matthew, it does take a lot of intention and uh, dil due diligence to make sure that the nominating committee is representative. And I think that's a more inclusive, th that group of people, just, just I've, I've been on the nominating committee now for three years and I think about the conversations we have, um, it, I think that's where it is. Because I think if you keep the parallel path, which kind of happened, I mean, yes, we ended up with three white women, but, it, but one of the people said, you know what, I don't like these two people. So I, I mean, and and I, I definitely had feelings about that. I'm like, wait a minute, I kind of trusted this process and I'd like to not there be a, another one. Um, so I think, and, and I also want to just jump in and say, I actually, when the idea of we can apply and here's the job description, um, I was with colleagues and I said, oh my God, I think I'm going to, I'm going to apply. I think there, and then first of all, you're not a minister. You're never going to get anywhere. Uh, the, I mean, I literally got, and then I, I mean, I didn't do it. I probably wouldn't have gotten far in the process, but I was genuinely discouraged from even trying. And so, um, that, that's where I would say, you know, of course, you know, there would have been great reasons for me not to go far at all, but the idea that I, I was kind of stopped before I even um, sent in kind of anything was, was, um, was disappointing. Cause then I was like, actually, maybe I would have gone far. I don't know. But, um, but anyway, so I, I actually, 
think that the thoughtfulness of having uh, due diligence about who's on the nominating committee, I feel will result in um, hopefully a more inclusive um, process. And, and I think that's been true for the UUA board, frankly, because we have, I think our UUA board's been, um, and I know Christina, you are on the UUA board, um, has been amazing because it's been way more uh, diverse than I think it has been in the past. Thanks. Wait. Oh, oh. Okay. So I, um, um, I want to actually spend a little bit of time, if we might, talking about identity. Um, you know, I think it would have been really wonderful to read your application, Asia. Like, I can't say whether how far you would have made it in the process because we never got your application. Um, but one of the things we name in the report, and it's not in the executive summary, so you have to dig a little bit. Um, is that we talked to um, about 60 people who were nominated, suggested, or interested in running, right? That group of 60 people had um, gender diversity, it had racial diversity, it had um, positional diversity in terms of ministers and religious educators and lay leaders, um, nonprofit executives, et cetera, on it, right? It, it was an in incredibly diverse list. And we encouraged people to submit applications and help them discern, right? And some people we, we encouraged pretty hard. Um, we received, I think it was nine applications. They were all from white cisgender women ministers, right? So like, Asia, if you had applied, I couldn't say that. <laughs> at the very at the very least your application would have made me not not able to say all of the people who applied for the job were white cisgender women ministers okay um so it you know it says something about what the what the implications are and we um we had follow up interviews with people who chose not to apply who did not fit those molds and we were we were told that there were um, there were issues in the way that campaigns were run. There were issues in the way that um, trust was given or not that um, basically told people not to. Um, there were there were issues, you know, you were not the only person discouraged from applying by informal networks of people. And that just, it makes me sad, right? Like the worst thing that could have happened if you applied is that we didn't interview you, right? Like that would have been the worst thing that could have happened. And then we could have been arguing over why we didn't interview you, but, uh, but that you are discouraged from even putting in an application just makes me sad, right? We had people um, who said, you know, they're, they're, who were ministers or religious educators who said, I can't take time off from my job. To campaign, right? I can't leave my congregation that, that, that I work for, or, you know, I can't leave this nonprofit agency that I've been running to, to, to do this. I can't, um, I can't tell my congregation that the congregation that I serve in whatever capacity as a, as a professional, um, I'm running for this job and then um, have them be uncertain as to whether I'm going to get it for 18 months. Uh, you know, people told us all sorts of things, but, but people, the more marginalized people's identities were, the more um, we, we heard that those structural things in the system were, were preventing them from even putting their applications in. Um, and it just, it made us, I think, as a committee, incredibly sad. Uh, I, I can, <laughs> that, our, our feelings are not in the report, but I think I think I can report report for the seven of us that that um, we were disappointed in the in the identity breakdown of who and you know we might have nominated only women anyway, but we never got to have that conversation, right? <laughs> Wayne, were you trying to say something? I was yeah. Um, I'll just follow up on what Michael said. I think there, part of the application pool that we got was a result of um, 
one group of uh, white male senior ministers of large churches stepping back. And nobody that was in that initial group of people that we were talking to uh, for a variety of reasons, but some of them, uh, I think a lot of them saying this is uh, time to step back. But it was also on the other side, I think uh, I made the point earlier that there was not enough encouragement, clarity uh, on our part about how a person who um, hasn't thought of themselves as even possibly being able to consider being a candidate for numerous reasons for this office to uh, to to be encouraged in a more assertive way than than I think that we did. Now, some of that encouragement happened individually in conversations that each of us, as a member of the commission, was having with people that we were either assigned or that we reached out to talk to. So I can't you know say that conclusively, but I I, I know that the recommendations. Um, make explicit, uh, advance discernment as a more assertive and aggressive process uh, that would help make people feel more confident that they should at least submit an application and take the next step in the process. Now, going back to Chris's point about the uh, uh, eliminating the run by petition as a, a significant controversial recommendation. I'll want to pair that with the other recommendation that I think is going to have significant controversy that the campaigns be publicly funded, uh, that we figure out a way to finance the UUA election without it having to involve personal fundraising on the part of people who might uh, uh, want to submit an application. I think that's a huge obstacle. And I think if there was some base level of public funding, that would help in a lot of people's discernment process. So I can argue on two sides of the issue about whether it's a good idea to remove the um, run by petition option. On the one hand, um, 25 congregations, the number of signatures you have to collect is still, I think, a difficult bar for somebody who has not necessarily been uh, had a high public profile in UUA politics um, and is not well known outside of their own region. And yet there are people there who could um, play the role of president. Uh, and uh, so I still think that it is an obstacle uh, to people who are um, marginalized because of a variety of uh, social stations or identities if we leave it in the way it is. And it'll be even more of an obstacle if we raise it to 50. Um, so it obviously has to be paired with other kinds of accessibility. I could see a scenario, however, and this is arguing against removing that petition process, just to take the other side for a moment. I could see a scenario where um, a number of applicants uh, for the next search committee um, are submitted. There is a discernment process and that there is somebody uh, who um, is uh, not seen by the search committee as somebody that they want to put in their final group. Um, and they do come from uh, one of the marginalized identities in the association and they still want access uh, and feel like they want to run as a candidate that is both for the larger association and to um, make a statement about uh, the uh, role, place, and, and um, value of that identity in top UUA leadership. And that petition process would still be available to them. I mean, I wonder whether we can have a process that trusts the search committee and recognizes that uh, when it comes right down to it, one, two or, with two or three or four candidates isn't going to necessarily encompass all of the possible people who could do this job and that ultimately the search committee does have to make a decision and somebody's going to feel left out and should they still be able to run by petition. So that's the other side of the argument for me. So let's talk about the public funding. I, now, I'm actually of two minds on that one. <laughs> so because... I mean, I, you know, public funding seems like a no brainer, except that such a huge part of that job is fundraising from my perspective that I want to know somebody can do that. Matthew, what do you got to say? Yeah, that's the way we initially approached it. We want, we did lower the limit with the delegates. We voted, you know, to set a ceiling on how much so that it wouldn't be so onerous. We thought it was important. To, the UA president has got to raise money. You got to be able to do that. And so we thought it was important. 
We were persuaded in our reflection interviews, in particular by Bill Sinkford, and who talked with us about this in our own thinking, that actually the work of raising $100,000 to run for UUA president is completely different than the work of raising $20 million for the UUA endowment or whatever the other kind of work is. And that the evidence of the ability to raise money um, is in the candidate's previous work experience um, and not in the campaign itself. So we would be looking for someone either through their nonprofit or church experience or through the UA board or other kind of committee um, who had a demonstrated capacity to ask for and raise significant amounts of money as a core piece of the job, which we decided it was. Not, you don't prove that by doing the campaign. You have, you've already demonstrated the capacity to do that. So I would say out there to people who are thinking about maybe in six years or 12 years or 18 years, they'd be interested in being president of the UUA um, to get some experience raising money. Um, and I'm sure, you know, there's some fundraising campaigns for the CLF or other things that need some volunteers and, you know, right. So that's how you prove you can raise money, not through the campaign. All right. You've convinced me. That makes Bill sense. convinced us. So, you know, yeah. Huh. I wonder if that will be controversial, though, because I, uh, I mean, once you once you frame it that way, because I think we all have enough places to give money, and it does feel like giving a lot of money to these campaigns. I, I've always wondered if, instead of raising money for campaigns, if the candidates got people to commit to giving money to the association's vision, you know, so that we so that people, somebody came in with that kind of commitment to whatever they wanted to do, um, because it seems like the campaigns in a way siphon money off from, from that kind of vision. Aisha, you got a question? Yeah, I was wondering ultimately who, um, what entity ultimately implements all these recommendations, the UUA board or the GA uh, delegates? Uh, it depends on the recommendation. Wayne might be able to speak to some of this more clearly, but um, some of them are things the some of these recommendations are just for the presidential, the next search committee. Some of them are for the nominating committee um, as they think about the dynamic on the, on the board. And I was going to lift up, you know, one of our key recommendations is around having a, a UU elder of color on the committee who can counter that kind of implicit gatekeeping that you experienced. Um, with more of a, you know, no, we want you, um, because the way that leadership is cultivated is different culturally. And so that's an important role. Some of them are things the UA board can just do. Some of them are things the the president needs to do in working with the staff to think about the way that UA staff might interact with this. Um, and then some of them are definitely going to require bylaws changes and delegate action. So let's get back to that issue that we kind of flagged earlier about UA staff. And, and also you flagged some issues with UUA board and leadership. Um, so I think this was the first campaign where one person was a staff member and one person wasn't. And from my perspective, that was a lot of the issue. Like when Bill Singford ran, he ran against another UUA staff person. As a UUA staff person who considered running a while ago, I realized I could never do it when anyone might ever think I was using the UA's money to do it. And I simply didn't have time to do it if I couldn't integrate it with the conversations I was already having. So I just let go of it. But I'm curious about the, you know, how that discussion went. And I flagged earlier, Michael and, and Wayne, you both have seen this from a lot of perspectives. So I'm, I'm curious about all of your perspectives on that. Let's start with the staff question, running for president as UA staff. I can start. I can start. Um, you know, I think it was a personal blind spot of mine to frame what the challenges were going to be for a staff person running in terms of the previous history. And um, I didn't personally think through what would be involved with one staff member being nominated uh, initially and the other person um, being a, a parish minister. Uh, the ambiguity uh, about the secretary's role in setting um, standards or playing a leadership role in brokering commonly agreed to standards uh, uh, for the candidates was, it changes from secretary to secretary. And uh, 
um, in this election, uh, Rob and Manish had conversations together about who was going to do what and cooperated together and worked together on how that was worked out. But uh, I think uh, I thought because of my previous experience, mostly about those two people working with the candidates around how the staff dynamic would come into play. And I didn't really think through the supervisorial role that the chief operating officer of the association played and how important uh, that would be in defining limitations for how a candidate who was a staff member could create a campaign and run it. Um, and so uh, I was taken aback by how um, little really we had engaged with um, Harlan Limpert and uh, with this issue in our committee. And I think it's one of the mistakes that we made, I think that we kind of acknowledge in the report. So in the future, um, uh, I'm, this is an internal discussion in the, in the staff for sure, but I think there's also a conversation with the board and a reporting on, by the uh, executive to the board about how these uh, limitations will be understood and what kind of support a staff member running for office can expect to receive from the association in terms of both time off um, and uh, a, a appropriate limits that allow a staff member to actually run a campaign that are realistic. Uh, and I think they were, they were too severe in the way that they were described to Sue Phillips. Yeah, I think, um, Meg, this wasn't actually the first time that happened because Bill Schultz was executive vice president when he ran and he did not run against the UUA staff person. Um, so, you know, just even the history has examples of when it did work. Um, but I, you know, I, I don't know exactly how to say this, right? And, and um, so I'm just gonna say it. <laughs> and some people might, might not like this. Um, I think that, that, uh, that UUA, uh, that the, the people who were running were treated differently by um, by the staff, um, based on how much support they had from within the staff for running, and um, I think that if uh, Sue Phillips had been the preferred candidate of the senior staff of the UUA, those those barriers would not have been put in place for her. Um, so I'm just going to say that uh, <laughs> that is not that is not the consensus opinion of a committee of seven. That is what what comes out of Michael Tino's heart um, about this. And it, um, yeah, so I'm just gonna leave it there. Cause I think, I think that those, those inequalities perpetuated themselves in the campaign even after Sue dropped out um, and it was unfortunate. Yeah, I'll say having been on UUA staff through many of these and of course we can't vote and I, I actually think that's appropriate. Um, but we have strong opinions, <laughs> right? And so it's always this, like we're not allowed to publicly state them or wear buttons or it, but you know, as we've talked about, there's so many informal conversations that are part of the culture. And so, you know, I, I know this time was, was, you know, my first time being so far out of the staff and, and I saw what other people had told me for years, which is it looks really different from their perspective and from mine, you know. So a lot of my staff member friends had very strong opinions that didn't make any sense to me now, but they would have probably if I still worked there, right? So it's just interesting how much your perspective and where you're located shifts what you're looking for and what you what you see. I'm I'm curious going forward, like what because we just have a couple minutes, what each of you just say a line about what do you hope comes out of this work that you did and what's your hope for the report? I hope that the recommendations are taken seriously. Um, you know, the exact shape of a future campaign schedule might be, you know, not exactly what we recommend or whatnot, but that we say, that this process is about a discernment about a spiritual leader for a religious movement, not a popularity contest, not a, you know, who do we like best, um, but is a serious, or who has most access to power, but really a serious discernment about who shall lead us in the times that are ahead of us. 
And that requires not just the committee's work, but the board and delegates and the movement as a whole. I hope that the board, you, uh, knowing how much it's got on its plate, will um, use its um, bully pulpit to invite conversation about some of the issues that are important in the report for wider congregational discussion. And uh, they do have uh, somewhat of a deadline, I think, because their role in naming the next search committee uh, starts next year. We, we turn over in 19, I believe and the new, the new search committee takes office. So um, several of the recommendations are time bound and uh, need to be implemented, uh, connected to the appointment of that committee. Others can take a little more time to talk and discern. So uh, I, I think the, the, uh, the ball that I'm looking to see uh, dribbled next <laughs> down the court is uh, in the hands of the board. And I hope that the next process feels open to people of color and people who are not ministers, both. Uh, in particular, those two those two uh, groups of identities, because this uh, we we got the feedback that this time it didn't feel like it was as open as we wanted it to be. Do you think a non-minister would have a realistic chance, though? Well, it depends on who gets to vote. Right. Well, I mean, let's let's be serious. Right. We're circling back to what, what's at the beginning. If the votes are cast in congregations at congregational meetings, um, you know, by people who've watched forums on videos, then sure, because I think that a non minister could be very persuasive. But if the votes are largely cast by minister delegates, probably not. You know, we when we made that list of people we wanted to talk to and, and people got suggestions, there are quite a few white people on that list. And we looked at that list and we thought, we asked this question, and we thought, could we see that white person as president? And we said, yeah, some people couldn't, but a lot of us, I mean, we on the committee could, and we thought, yeah, that particular person, yeah. So when we make it not abstract, but like, that person who's been in leadership in this way and this way and this way for so long, yeah, they could do the job. Do they got to be able to preach? Yeah, but people who aren't ministers can preach. You know, there are other skill sets ministers should have that way people have too. So yeah, it's possible. And I would just say, Aisha, after the last 15 months, I think anything's possible. No. That's exactly what I was going to say. That, yeah, we, you know, the other thing to keep in mind is this was going on in 2015, right? So um, the, the landscape has, has radically shifted and that's a good thing. Well, some of the landscape shifting is a good thing. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah there's, there's all kinds of shifting going on. This has been a great conversation. I hope it's sparking conversations for the people who are watching. I know a couple of people, Susan Archer, Michael Mitchell, you know, just we're appreciating the conversation. So glad you were here with us. Next week, we're going to have the Commission on Institutional Change with us. They'll be um, at this General Assembly really um, speaking offering of, their reflections. Yeah. Speaking what? of landscape shifting. Yeah, speaking of land shapes. Yeah. So thank you so much for all of your work and for being here with us today and see you next time.